<clears throat> yeah. Hey everybody, my name is Thomas. I'm Shetty's campaign manager. Um, this year we're having a digital campaign. So we're having weekly town halls where we invite different subject matter experts and different resources and people from our community on to talk about issues that matter to us. Um, one of the most important things right now that you can do to help is to volunteer if you've got the time. Uh, we have phone banking opportunities, text banking opportunities, as well as donating. Donating really does help. Uh, we're trying to be as um, people funded as possible. So uh, we have a lot of small donations. We're not taking any big money from PACs and from um, special interest groups that uh, are seeking to basically buy our time and attention. Um, we're really just looking to talk with as many people as we can right now. So in that mind, if you could please take a moment, like and share the stream. Um, try and help get this out in front of as many people as you can right now. It really does help us grow the campaign. Um, if you have any groups that are interested in having us come speak with them, let us know. Big or small, we'll take our time to come uh, and meet with your group or organization to uh, hear what their interests are and make sure that we can uh, hear that or make sure that everybody is heard. Um, so with that, I'd like to take a second and just hand over to Shetty for today's Hi, I'm Shadi Zaytun. I'm running to be your senator from Texas's 12th Senate District. When we hear the term tenant rights, most of us are probably thinking about someone in an apartment fighting with their landlord. And while that would be covered under this subject, it encompasses so much more. I'll pro pose a couple questions for you to think about during our discussion tonight. Is housing a human right? What steps should we take to address housing insecurity? I'd like to hear your thoughts on this at the end. No matter what source you look at, one of the pillars of survival is always shelter. If we believe every person has a right to food and a right to health care, does it not stand to reason that they also have a right to housing? Now I'm not saying that we should build everyone a house or anything like that. But if this is something we consider a right for everyone, then we need to take steps to ensure that people's housing is secure. With COVID, we're seeing now more than ever just how fragile the housing situation is for many of us in this country. As with so many other facets of our governance during this crisis, our current leaders have let us down ag uh, yet again when it comes to housing. Instead of implementing a thorough testing and tracing program, they've left us out without the leadership and the tools necessary to guide us in a time when we need it the most. Our leaders worked to bail out businesses in our state instead of people, forgetting who they were sent to Austin to represent. Or maybe they were just serving those they were paid to protect. It's frustrating to me that they've declared their half measures successes. They may have temporarily helped some, but the bill is still coming due. Sadly, all of them seem to be suddenly busy trying to hide their inactions in office during this election behind normal campaign rhetoric. Pretending like the sparse highlights they put out on social media and postcards are what they do daily instead of when they're just looking for your vote. They're just disconnected with how people in our community actually live. Freezing evictions was the right start, but it did not fix the problem. It only delayed it. While it kept people in their homes during the shutdown, it did nothing to help them when the eviction started back up. It also did nothing to help the owners whose tenants no longer had jobs. Their tenants are not allowed to be evicted, but they're also not able to pay rent. Half measures or just ignoring the issue completely has been the response we've seen. There are no easy answers when it comes to housing. It's gonna take real effort and work to make things better. And I'm not gonna say that I have all the answers. One of the reasons I hold these town halls, in addition to providing information for you, is that I can invite people who are experts in areas we're talking about and hear their ideas to incorporate those that I can into my platform. I know a lot of people expect their elected officials to know how to fix everything. And while I think I have good ideas to fix a lot of problems we face, there's always room for more knowledge. My knowledge and experience is limited to what I've studied and what I've done. So many others have such a different perspective, I think it's important to learn whenever I can at every opportunity to help me make better decisions. I think part of a good leader is the willingness to know you cannot know everything, combined with the ability to listen to those who know more and learn. To help us get a little more informed tonight, we've invited Stuart Campbell and Evan Stone, some great volunteers and attorneys who have experience with housing issues and have been working towards driving their own vision of change for our community. Thank you both for coming. Uh, I'll give you a quick moment to tell us about yourself. Um, Evan, you wanna go first? 
Sure. Uh, I'm Evan Stone. I'm a Denton-based attorney, and I work with a lot of landlord-tenant cases. Uh, I'm a referral attorney for the Texas Tenants Union, and I've taken many, many cases to trial on behalf of tenants here in the community and also on behalf of landlords. Okay. And Stuart, you're muted. I'm muted. You're right. I, I fell for the, the trap. Uh, my name is Stuart Campbell. I am a uh, nonprofit attorney here in Tarrant County. Um, I live in SE 12, which is, uh, should be familiar to everyone right now. And uh, I'm also a Bernie Sanders national delegate for SE 12. And I, um, like, like Evan, I, I, I do a lot of landlord tenant stuff. I focus only on tenants rights in my job. And I give a lot of presentations um, for my job. I do have to say right now, I technically am not wearing my, my job hat because I can't. Um, so I'm not going to tell you where I work. But for those of you who know me, you know where I work. And um, yeah, I basically spend my days uh, nine to five fighting for tenants um, against landlords and suing landlords. Okay. So let me, let me ask, just here recently, what have you been seeing? How's it been looking out there? Kind of a state of Tarrant County. So yeah, I guess I can I can speak a little bit to to Tarrant County, and I would love to hear Evan speak about what what he's seeing in, in Denton County. Um, but what what we let me just back up and and avoid your question just for just one second. <laughs> this <clears throat> this presentation this webinar couldn't be better planned because today's the 25th of August, and tomorrow, of course, the 26th, we're going to see the expiration of the first 30 day window after the CARES Act um, uh, eviction moratorium has expired. Um, I know that's a, a lot of legal jargon basically in one sentence, but if I could boil it down to what it actually means is that not only in Tarrant County, not only in Denton County, but across the state, but across and also across the nation where we're about to see a crazy huge wave of evictions. Um, and today is the last day for a lot of people um, before they get an eviction filed on them tomorrow. Um, so there's gonna be a whole bunch of people in the next 48, 72 hours that are going to receive their first ever eviction notice, their first ever visit from a constable um, and being served an eviction summons. Um, and, and for most of these folks, it's gonna be their first time ever going to court or ever interacting with the court system. Um, and so I just wanna preface that by saying, the timing of this exact uh, webinar, this exact live stream, is couldn't be more on the nose. Um, but what's happening in Tarrant County is that from the expiration of the statewide eviction moratorium, which expired on May 18th, so starting on May 19th, the justice courts here immediately started hearing cases. And evictions started, uh, evictions that were being heard on, on May 19th and have not stopped since. And so every day we're, we're still having people um, getting eviction judgments against them and being displaced after the writ of possession is issued by the constable. Um, and, and it hasn't stopped. Like I said, we're, we're seeing cases being heard both in person and over Zoom. Uh, for the most part, though, they're going to be in person. And uh, I will say the CARES Act has had what, what I think is a good impact on eviction filing numbers because in some months where we would see 500, 600, 700 filings per month in Tarrant County, we're seeing about 150 per month in the summer months right now. But what that means is that this huge wave that's building up, that's been building up since March, and it's it, and and it's going, it was already going to be higher numbers because of COVID and and because of the 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 economy dipping and people losing their jobs and people having to stay inside. This huge wave that is being held up by this kind of false dam, which is the CARES Act, is about to come down and it comes down tomorrow for potentially hundreds of thousands of people um, just in DFW alone. And, and so that's what we're preparing for, at least on, on my side of things, on the tennis rights side. I'm excited to hear what's, what Evan has to say about Denton. So um, I, I was talking to Shadi yesterday about uh, tracking data in Denton and uh, I don't have super current stuff. My mine dropped off around April. I think I made it through the end of April of this year. Um, 
And so I can talk about what this year looked like. We were in from January, which is always, I mean, for the, I, I guess I track back about seven years and January is always the, the heaviest month, of course. So we had 1,062 eviction cases filed in January and then it dropped down to 791, 482, and only 35 in the month of April. So um, I do wanna go back and get the rest of these numbers and I'm happy to, to share those wherever you want them shared because I find them fascinating and I've got breakdowns from court to court and that sort of thing too. I, um, I've been getting a lot of landlord tenant calls. So, and, and I've handled one eviction case so far. I was actually representing the landlord on that one, but, um, it was a situation in which I was really sympathetic to my client's situation. And, um, you know, he is, a uh, a large part of his monthly income was coming from his one and only very tiny rental property and he had not been paid for for many months and he tried to work out some stuff with the tenant but they couldn't so we went to court for that one and like you said yeah these cases are in person and that's really weird right now um i don't know if any of you have been into jp1 here in denton that's the court right over there on carol and hickory and right though i want to say right now last time i was in there it was covered in plastic um, they, all they did was buy shower curtains and they hung them throughout the court and they made the plaintiff stand on one side and the defendant stand on the other side. Um, there were barriers in, in front of the bench and, uh, it was, it was a little surreal. Um, the other thing that was surreal was, uh, how fast we received judgment in that case. Um, so I mean, we, we won, but I, uh, I don't know <laughs> there was i didn't really even get to put on the documentary evidence that i had prepared so that's uh i think that's a big issue i see in denton county um and uh it didn't didn't feel like due process was was really being followed quite as closely as it should have there but yeah that's that's the recent stuff i've seen that's kind of getting into something i'll get into in a little bit because <laughs> sure. that's a whole nother um i don't know one of y'all want to tell us kind of what that process looks like when somebody's getting evicted. So landlord says they're not paying. What are the steps there? Um, Evan, I'll let you take that unless you want me to, I like, it's better for you to take that instead of me because uh, sure, I'm happy to, cause um, I'm always telling new clients different tricks, how to, uh, how to get out of it and <laughs> what sort of things we pack first and um, just different strategies like that. Uh, basically, in Texas, under the Texas Property Code, the landlord has to put a notice to vacate on the door uh, three days before they can file suit. And I see landlords screw this up all the time. Um, it can either, the notice can either go on the inside of the main door, in which case it can be bare, but if it goes on the outside of the main door, that notice has to be in an envelope that says important documents across the front. And you still get landlords all the time posting those notices to vacate bare on the front door and that's bad notice and i've saved a lot of people from eviction just by attacking that um so once that notice goes up then the constable comes out usually pretty promptly and puts an official citation notifying the person that they are being sued for eviction and then a, a hearing gets set usually between 10 to 14 days later that's gotten weird because of the pandemic but my typical approach with tenant clients is to demand a jury and you can do that up to three days before the hearing occurs so naturally we drag that out as far as possible and then we put in our our jury notice and pay the 20 dollars jury fee and the case gets pushed back because they've got to put together a jury um and uh, i just i think with a lot of these jps they see landlords so frequently that they build up this familiarity with the landlords and then they have a, a bias towards believing what the landlord says just because of that familiarity and i don't horribly begrudge them that because it's really just human nature but the tenants who are going in there are usually going in there for the very first time so they don't have that rapport and that's why i always encourage my clients to request a jury in those cases in addition to it just pushing the case back and um once you go to the trial if you lose you've got five days to file an appeal and while you're waiting for the appeal to be processed you have to pay rent you've got to pay some kind of rent to the court's registry while it's all pending and that's really tough for some people um i've had other clients who have plenty of money to stay there but the landlord just wants them out for some bogus reason and i i kept one client in a house for eight months after he lost an eviction trial and he just kept paying that money into the registry and he was completely entitled to stay there but no appeal is filed or if they cannot make those payments into the registry then 
uh, after five days, the other side can move for a writ of possession. And it's only then that the constable gets to go out and forcibly remove someone from their home, which, um, yeah, is always heartbreaking. Yeah. But we've usually been able to avoid that in my cases. That's good. Um, that, that's kind of the problem is, so what's the next step? I, I'll kind of ask you, Stuart, that. So after somebody gets evicted, I, th I think you might deal with this part a little more. What happens to them? I mean, they're homeless, but I, I don't, or, or a person without a home to. Yeah. That, so, sorry. No, that's right. No, I, you don't have to apologize to me. Uh, well, no, but I mean, we need to, when we make a mistake, we need to see, change it ourselves. Understood, um, and I agree. Uh, I will tell you, I, 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 use the, I use the term quite often, and I know I shouldn't. Um, we try to use unhoused, um, but yes, uh, I'm right there with you. So what we typically see for individuals who become displaced after being forcibly removed from their home by a constable and the landlord is either they, they move in with friends and family, um, which is what we probably see the most out of, uh, but as you might understand, most not, I mean, a lot of people might not have friends and family in the area for them to move into. Uh, either sleep on a couch or, or, or in a guest bedroom or, or sometimes on the floor. Um, and so that usually puts people in their cars and parking lots. And so that's where we see Walmart being one of our biggest housers because we, we have their parking lots and, and Target and, and big, chain, big chain stores end up being some of the places where you'll see a large, large increase, especially in some of our more urban areas um, of, of cars parked outside for long periods of time. Um, and, and just anecdotally from speak, speaking to social workers that I interact with um, on clients behalf, they've seen a large uptick already in that. And, if, and this is pre expiration of CARES Act. This is pre-wave and that's terrifying. Um, and there is a small percentage that ends up on the street. And, and, uh, and for those, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to tell you what happens to them. I mean, some of the most tragic stories I hear um, doing intake with potential clients are people who have said, well, I just spent six months on the street because I was evicted. What can, you, what can you do to help me? And um, I, I, it's hard for me to, to give them the direct answer besides just reaching out to the social network, the social a worker network, the nonprofit network that I know and trying to hook them up with some benefits. Um, but yeah, there is going to be a chunk of them, chunk of individuals and families that wind up on the streets or sleeping in Walmart parking lots, unfortunately. And I think that's just only gonna get higher over the next six months to a year until um, until hopefully on Congress acts or the state legislature acts and, and provides some type of uh, tenant assistance and, and, and hopefully some other more protections for housing too. Yeah, and I, I think there's some other parts of that that most people don't think about either, because these people aren't just individuals, they're families. So you're putting children out of their schools, uh, potentially out of their schools, because if you don't have an address, it's kind of hard to get registered for school and kind of hard to attend on time, not to mention the stress that it puts on the individual and the family. So yeah, I mean, imagine, imagine having kids um, attending virtual school right now, and there's no place to plug. I mean, even if you have a school supplied iPad or laptop, what is it? You're gonna, are you gonna use the Wi-Fi in the Walmart parking lot? I mean, for some some places do, but it's just it, it 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 puts so many impediments that it's so many roadblocks into someone's life that it's just it's there's so many variables that it's just impossible to even summarize at this in, in a meeting like this. Um, because there's just so many things that you take for granted as someone who's been housed their entire life uh, or someone who's never even faced the risk of being unhoused. It, it, it just never crosses your mind that think like, oh, I, I might have to go find a place to live in three days after you get a three-day notice to vacate. Or, or worse, you get an eviction judgment and there's a big red sticker on your door from a constable. Okay, well, I have, I have until 8 a.m. the 8 a.m. tomorrow morning to get all my stuff out and go find somewhere else. Or, and if I try to resist, I'll be put in handcuffs and put in the back of a squad car. And so will my kids until the landlord moves my property out. I, so many people take for granted the safety and security of, 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 of having an apartment or having a home and don't realize 
how that one thing is just the domino to poverty. And then all of a sudden, your life's a mess. You lose your job. Your kids lose their education. You might lose your own education. And it's just, uh, it's such a, like you said at the top of this meeting, it's such a fundamental thing to our lives having shelter and safety. Um, but yeah, that probably didn't answer your question. But. No, it's, I mean, it's part of it. Um, kind of goes to the next issue of have we been, have you been seeing a racial bias in um, the amount of in the people who are needing help? Evan, do you want to talk about that? You know, um, I I would say that most of my clients are people of color. I don't know what the breakdown of the demographics in Denton County are. Um, I I feel like just anecdotally yeah they're they're facing a harder time in the legal system in general um as with so many other systems so um yeah i could for for me just my my anecdata i think that uh the majority of of my tenant clients being evicted um they're they're people of color uh insofar as the the jps themselves showing bias I, in, a, in any kind of racial sense, I don't think I've noticed much of a trend of that. Um, and, you know, I, I take a lot of cases in Dallas, too, and a lot of the JPs in, in Dallas are, are people of color. And I, I think that certainly helps things. Um, and Denton right now, let's see, where, what's the makeup in Denton? Is Chris Lopez the only JP of color in Denton? Do you guys know the I think, I, I think he might be. As far as I'm not sure. Know. Certain, yeah. So I like him a lot. Of, I have found him to be very fair. Um, so I, you know, I, I've seen, I would say that I've probably seen more racial bias in criminal cases than in any of my eviction cases here. Okay. Well, that's not good either. No. Nope. Actu actually, it kind of ties into the next part. So you ran for the 393rd District Court, uh, 2016, right? Yeah. So it kind of brings me to a thing that these cases are decided by JP judges, the so justice mm -hmm. of the peace, which yeah. are elected, which I have my own thing about electing judges to begin with. I kind of sure. find it hard for a judge to stay un unbiased if they're having to solicit people for donations. But th that's not the point of what of this. Um, so my, my, my thinking is these people don't have to have lawyers, so they're not necessarily well versed in the law. Is that true? Yeah, you don't you don't have to have a law degree is, and you don't have to have a law license to be a JP. Um, so that's uh, that, you know, it, it that does bring about some interesting problems. Um, you know, I, I remember a decade ago when I was trying one of my first cases in the JP court and I'm rattling off some case law and asking if the court needs a citation and court judges eyes just kind of glaze over um, <laughs> because I didn't know that at the time. So I, I think it, it occasionally presents some problems, but at the same time, um, you know, ha having, it's not easy to get into law school and it's expensive. And JP courts, most of those cases, the small claims cases um, are supposed to be such small potatoes that I don't know if we as society really need to put some overeducated individual up on that bench to handle that stuff. But you can run into problems when you when you have a case like an eviction case. I mean, it's like somebody's home is on the line. It's not just the neighbor's dog ate my rose bush and now I'm suing them. And so uh, I, that's, it's been an issue for me just insofar as eviction cases. I, I will say that I think appealing those and going up to county court at law, you're getting a fair shake in that county court, especially here in Denton County. Um, I, I think that is one of the most level-headed uh, just intelligent judges I've ever practiced before, and I've lost plenty of cases in his court, <laughs> but I still think he's <laughs> just smart and he's fair. And um, so it's not, you know, other than having to keep paying the rent, uh, it's not hard to get an appeal up into the county court at law, and then it's a court of record, and the rules of evidence apply, and the rules of civil procedure apply, and you've got a judge who is, you know, a, an actual attorney, and who's you know heard some really sophisticated stuff and knows how to deal with it. So, I think, uh, you know, it, it, to me, I 
I'm not the kind of person who would make a really intense push for JPs to have to have law licenses. I've I've gotten accustomed to the system here. I think it keeps costs down, and I think that most of the time they're doing their job well enough. Um, so for I mean for for non lawyers, I think they're making the right sorts of judgments and and they know the law well enough to handle the cases how they handle them. So. Do you, do you see any kind of biases between the different JPs depending on just if you don't want to, if you no, don't want to go into that I know you still have to practice in front no, of them so I won't hold your feet to I'll, the fire too hard on it <laughs> I'll say this um, I did I started a major project uh, about seven years ago uh, scraping the dockets of Denton County and putting together numbers on eviction cases specifically and looking at like how many are filed in this court and how how many go in favor of the landlord and how many go in favor of the tenant and there is tremendous disparity there but i don't talk about my specific findings because there are so many other factors that i know i haven't considered and you know just you know if you're out in argyle and it's, it's just a bunch of large homes that are all you've got all homeowners on lots of acreage versus some multi-dwelling units and um with you know lower income areas sure there's going to be more eviction cases there and you know it's college students and they don't know what they're doing or they don't show up and you get you know we've got some some precincts where the number of defaults is just staggering and it's because i think the the defendants are unsophisticated and uh you know inexperienced and they're just they're not showing up they don't understand the consequences and so you have the numbers really 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 spike in certain areas so i uh i want that to be a i, I want to hang on to that project i like i said i'm still running numbers through april of this year i need to update that but um i'm going back about seven years right now and i've seen some really fascinating trends and i just want to put all the rest of the pieces of that puzzle together before i i publish it or try to share it in any meaningful way okay what about you stuart do you see on the tarrant county side a big difference between the jps Yes. So there's a tremendous difference between, and I'm just going to put them into two categories, right? And, and it's not even partisan. Um, it would be easier for me to say if it was, but it's not. Um, and there's going to be, there's pro tenant or, or tenant sympathetic JPs. And then there's landlord sympathetic JPs. And I haven't run the data, um, but if I did, I would assume that I could pick the two or three JPs that are pro tenant and then the other five or six or, or seven would be pro landlord. And uh, yes, it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, and it, it, vary, it varies wildly too. I mean, you might have a visiting judge who used to be the, the, the JP in that same precinct come and um, visit while the current JP is, is on vacation and get a completely different outcome. Um, and those same two people are in the same political party. So you, you just never know. Uh, biases, uh, biases of the of the courts vary, and it, it really comes down to that the per, the personal ide ideology of that individual. Of course, the facts matter, right? If it's clear cut, and you're delinquent on rent, and um, and the landlords don't everything everything correctly, well, the justice of of the peace is. Uh, is pretty limited on what he or she can do. Right. Uh, they're going to have to decide in favor of the law, um, and and most likely rule for the tenant, if, because that's just the way the law is in this state. It, it, the law in this state is very black and white, and so at least as it pertains to landlord tenant um, non-payment or rent evictions. But uh, no, there's a, a wide discrepancy in who's in what justices of the pieces are willing to listen to tenants, and what that listening means. Or actively engage them in any way, and there all are also a big discrepancy in uh, in the the level of proof that it takes to prove a case. Um, like what Evan was saying, he didn't have to prove up his documents in his last default. Um, well, some some justice courts require you to actually show that you gave a notice to vacate and show that there was a lease and show that you have a ledger that says that they're delinquent on rent. And other ones just take your word for it. And so, um, again, there's no, I, I wish it was as simple as this is a Republican issue or a Democratic issue, but it's not. It's, it's their biases are, are deeper than that, unfortunately. I will say one political party tends to, and it's a Democratic party, tends to 
be more pro tenant. Um, but that doesn't mean that all of them are going to be pro tenant. And so, but yes, to answer your question in short, there is a wide discrepancy from neighborhood to neighborhood to precinct to precinct in, in Tarrant County. Okay. So that kind of leads into protections for tenants and stuff. So would you, how would you feel about something like a tenant bill of rights? Uh, I don't think we really have anything like that here, but I know it's on the book in several other states. Evan? I, I, I totally support the idea. I haven't looked at one of those in a long time, but um, I, you know, when, when we last spoke, I mentioned cities doing simple things like having ordinances about how cool the house has to be kept in the summer and how hot it has to be heated in the winter. And if you violate that, it's a, it's a clear violation of the landlord and it's easy to take them to task for it or, or easy to get out of your lease. Um, so I, I love those, you know, we, we have a few good protections here. I know one of the big ones is for uh, family violence or domestic violence. If that happens, there's a pretty easy route out of your lease uh, if you're a victim of uh, assault family violence in Texas. So those protections are wonderful. And yes, I would love to see more stuff like that. And, um, and, and I would like to see certain things just codified better. Right now, there are some vagaries in the code about, you know, we've got this presumption that a landlord has to make a repair within seven days, but then you got to give a new notice to your landlord if they fail to make that. And you got to wait another seven days. And then, and like I said, it's a presumption, so it's rebuttable. So if the landlord says, well, you know, the availability of materials and labor right now is way down because of COVID, then, then they get all this extra time before they have to make the repair. And I think that's ridiculous. You know, if you're, I've got a client right now who's, house partially flooded and there it's been roughly three quarters of the house or well i'd say maybe half of the house is unlivable because the renovations are taking so long and it's been going i think for three months of renovations and they just all their furniture is piled up here and the cabinets are being stripped out the carpets being stripped out and that three months is just too long to make a home livable for someone again i mean if you know the landlord should should put them in new housing or work something out with them. And uh, I, I think stuff like that is, it's crazy. And you shouldn't have to pay some lawyer thousands of dollars to go to court and force the landlord to do what the landlord is supposed to be doing in the first place, which is providing, you know, a livable home. So I've, yeah, I've only, I've only tried one constructive eviction case ever. And, uh, and we did win, but it's, it's just tricky to do that. Um, and, yeah, I, I would love to see more stuff out, out there that's just says you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, and here it is. Place has to be livable, and here's how we define what that means. Right, it, and I think for it to be effective, any tenant bill of rights needs to be e easily digestible. Right, yeah. there needs to be something that says the landlord has the right or has the duty to do X, and then of course statute to interpret that, but the overarching theme has to be X is some is a duty they cannot violate. Right. Right. Um, because right now, as Evan said, the biggest issue that one of the biggest issues I see whenever I'm doing intake is repairs. Yeah. Right. There's mold, there's cockroaches, there's rats, the locks are broken. Uh, there's a flood, the AC is not working against 107 degrees, that kind of stuff. Yep. All right. Well, it's extremely hard for a tenants rights attorney to advise you on what you should do because it's going to be based on a whole bunch of things. It's yeah. going to be based on what you've already done. It's going to be based on what your lease says. And it's, and it's going to be based on basically in, in some cases, what precinct you live in uh, depending on, because it's going to, it's it, on the judge. every JP might interpret that very in confusing statute in a different way. Um, for example, there's two JPs in, in Tarrant County. Um, one is a Republican, one is a Democrat who inter interprets certain things as emergencies. Well, that's not certain repairs as emergencies and will allow you to break your lease quickly. Well, that's not in the, in the statute anywhere. Right. Uh, it's, it's just something he made up because he thinks it's right. Well, I, I, I agree with him. Um, and so whenever there is a tenant bill of rights, there needs to be a set of five or 10 or so rights that a tenant can look at a cheat sheet provided by a nonprofit and say, landlord didn't do this. All right, I'm, I'm going to justice court. Um, and it, it should be that simple. Uh, it shouldn't take a law degree or even then, I mean, 
it shouldn't take a lot of degree or for you to hire an attorney or go to a, a nonprofit like the one I work for for you to get legal advice. And even that legal advice is wishy-washy because it's going to depend on a bazillion different variables. Because uh, like you just, I, I never know. I just, there's so many variables. Like I, I don't, it's hard for me to give someone like actual actionable advice on a repair issue because there's just so many different crazy things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, that's just me ranting, but <laughs> there's so many things. I mean, late fees, I mean, we got a great late fee law recently, just at the same session that we had the new amendment to uh, the, uh, the domestic violence law, which made it easier to break your lease, which has helped a tremendous amount of my clients because um, we have a lot of domestic violence clients. Um, but uh, those are two things that could be strengthened um, because they're still not perfect. Um, and just made clear so a, a lay person can look at a, a fact sheet a fact sheet and say okay landlord you're supposed to do this yeah i, I think that would be a, a good thing to have is that clear bill of rights that you don't need a lawyer to go in front of a jp to say look he didn't do this right and I, i've tried to go in front of a jp on my own against a lawyer before for, for a layman, it's not easy. <laughs> as much as you read and as much as you think you know, you never know as much as the lawyer across from you. Oh, well, let, just I'll let, I'll let you in on a secret. They're just pretending to know stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll say my, my JP fell asleep in the middle of the trial. I don't think that helps me. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Well, maybe it I don't know. Play it off. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I lost. It, it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway. So I guess my next question would be, what do y'all think about the reps, the work our reps have done so far? Um, go to you first, Evan. In terms of just- In terms of, yeah, tenant rights. Law for Texas? Ten, I mean, you can go tenant rights and COVID, honestly, because I kind of think the answer is similar on both. I, you know, I have not watched the changes in the property code over time well enough to know, you know, who's made the big changes when they were made. Um, it's just kind of, you know, here's here's the property code I'm stuck with, and I'm going to read the cases that interpret it as as they come down. But you know, those are judges, not not our legislators. So I don't, I can't speak to that too much. Okay. How about you, Stuart? Uh, it's get it. It's been a give and take. And last session was a it the, the the bad part is the floor is so low for what's considered good um because last session was i would say good historically speaking because we got we got three statutes two of which were were um uh the primary author was nicole collier here in fort worth um that really were pro tenant and that's the uh, late fee statute and the uh, the towing statute, because now there's a new towing protection statute. Yeah, there's a new towing protection statute um, that makes it a little bit more tricky for the the uh, the landlord to tow. Not very well publicized, by the way. Evan, I can see your yeah. curiosity. <laughs> oh yeah, because I love suing tow companies. That's that's uh, another hobby of mine. When, tow companies uh, are a whole nother. <laughs> uh, if it hasn't gone and it, it was either going to be, yeah, it should be effective Jan, Jan one, either Jan okay. one or, or September one Okay. Of last year or not last year, but you know what I mean? Um, but the late fee statute was a great, a great addition because it, it took, uh, it used to be what like this reasonable, this language, right. And there was some case law that defined that, but you had to know that there was case law that defined that. Yeah. Um, because people were getting, if your if your rent was 500 bucks, they'd be charging you 600 bucks in late fees. And he's just like, wait, what? Like I have been late for two months. Yeah. Okay. But now my late fees is more than one month's rent. What's going on here. Um, but that new late fee law caps it more or less caps. It it still has some kind of squishy language in it, but caps it at like 10% for apartment complexes and 12% for houses. That's great. Okay. Right. Um, we know that one. And we could talk about that offline because there's still some squishiness. It needs to be fixed, but it's a great step forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so last session, I would say, was a trend in the right direction. Um, and 
again, our local Tarrant County um, representative, Nicole was, Nicole Collier was on the leading front of that too, uh, which has been great. Um, and Terry Canales down in the Valley is also a great rep for this too. But um, historically it's been terrible. I mean, uh, it, it, there's been no right to cure push for, for tenants. There's been no time period in which you can pay back your rent, which is the right to cure, right? Um, and so in, in some states, for example, like even in some of the most conservative states, like in Alabama, Tennessee, they have right to cures. So if I get a notice to vacate that says you have to be out within three days, if I pay my money within three days, that I'm all rent, that is not including late fees, but depending on the state, uh, then I get to stay there. They don't get, they, or if they did file the eviction, they would lose, right? Um, but in this state, there is no right to cure. So you get a notice to vacate, you have no options. It's that notice to vacate is time to go. You know, they're, they're going to file an eviction. Um, so even if you had the money, even if grandma was able to loan you some money, or even if you got a bonus from work, or you had, or if you move some things around to get the money, the landlord has no duty to accept it. So they can evict you, and it, it honestly gives them cover for discriminatory practices or retaliatory practices. If you request a repair and you're and you're late on rent, well, too bad, you're evicted. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of things that need to be fixed, but over the sessions. In, in 17, we saw a little bit. In 19, we saw a, a bigger jump. We had three or four ten, pro tenants uh, statutes, but still, there there is so much room for improvement that it's you can't even describe that, it. I mean, that's the next question. Go ahead. What, what what's the first thing you would have me start working on when I get to Austin? Well, I think I already said mine, but Evan, do you want to you want to go <laughs> first? Or you want me to go? Um, what wait. wait. What was yours? So mine would be a right to cure. The right, right? to cure is the big one. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's huge. I, I guess mine would probably have to do with repairs and just making more sense of that because it's a super muddy part of the code. Um, I've got an appeal right now. We had a tenant case that we won the jury trial, um, and then it went to – because that was already at county court level, the appeal went up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. So that's going to be a long drawn out thing forever. And some of it had to do with the muddiness of the repair provisions in the statute. So um, clarifying that I think would help a ton because yeah, like Stuart, I see so many clients who just, you know, something their, their place is a wreck or it's roach infested or rat infested, or you've got water dripping through light fixtures in the ceiling. I mean, some really crazy stuff. And um, that there isn't an easier, quicker remedy for those sorts of things kind of blows my mind. Um, I've, you know, I've subpoenaed the city inspectors from the city of Denton before to come and, and stay on the witness stand. They're talking about what's going on in some of these houses and they're showing photos. And, the, you know, yeah, the landlord's at least been cited for it, but the landlord's still renting his properties to all these other people. And you just don't see a, a ton of meaningful recourse. Well, we actually garnished like about five grand from that landlord's bank account, but that's, that's, that was a rarity, you know? So the exception, not, not the rule. I, yeah. I am uh, not to get off topic. I'm very curious about your appeal. I have a couple of appeals actually from uh, your County court of law too, uh, no, which no. is, which is why I was interested in, in, uh, in your comment earlier about his, uh, his, I have four appeals from the court. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, um, I'm, I'm actually really curious about that one. Um, the one that you just mentioned. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, my, that case, I, I, I'm happy to talk a little bit about it now. If you, if y'all want to yeah, hear it, it's up to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So my, my client, um, she lived in that part of North Dallas that bleeds into Denton County. Yep. And, uh, she didn't really get a good chance to look at the property. Um, it, this guy rents a whole string of, of duplexes in this one area and um, power was off when she first looked at it She and there were still boxes and stuff for the previous tenant so she couldn't really tell what was going on she said it was probably alright neighborhood seemed alright she signed the lease when she actually moved in it was a wreck um, it was so bad you know she took a bunch of photos sent them to the landlord that night 
and he said, you're a liar, everything's working, and hung up on her, and didn't fix anything at all. Water starts coming up from the floor, I think, on day three. Uh, it was just a disaster. Mm -hmm. So she was gone on, on day six. She was out of there, just said, forget it, give me my money back. And he said, heck no, I'm going to sue you. And we look him up, and, well, he's sued over 100 of his tenants before, so it seemed, you know, that threat was was likely uh, to be, you know, made made true. And uh, so we just we we decided to strike first, and we started in the county court at law. We weren't going to fool with the JPs, and it was a jury trial, two day long jury trial, and the jury awarded us forty seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So it was nuts. And I and I think part of the appeal was based on, you know, we got we got damages for the breach of contract, we got damages for constructive eviction. And those are supposed to both be equitable remedies, so I don't know if those really could have stacked the way the jury stacked them. But the proper challenges weren't made to the jury instructions, so I think that one's kind of a done deal. And then we got a bunch of money for failure to repair and also unlawful withholding of the deposit. Um, and not just unlawful withholding, but unlawful withholding in bad faith. Bad faith, yeah. Yeah, so it all went out. All, and then, of course, my fees, because this – case drug on i think two years before we had the jury trial and you know the guy was filing motions for everything he could and um it was just a nasty nasty case and he's a nasty nasty guy and um so it went up to the court of appeals and i think it, it's one of those that i almost didn't have to file an answer <laughs> to his appeal <laughs> it's uh he you know when you see a guy and he's pro se that's the best part so he he's representing himself and when when i saw his motion uh, for for leave to exceed the word count, I said, knock yourself out, buddy. <laughs> so his appeal is like 114 single space lines, 114 pages of single space type. And, oh, oh uh, my God, you agree to him to, <laughs> for him to? <laughs> oh yeah, he can fall on that sword himself. Yeah, that, I was fine with that. So right. my response is really short and sweet. And you know, it's 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 our case to lose. I, I don't want to sound too too sure of myself about it we'll see what happens but uh yeah there are just some real slum lords out there and uh i don't know this one i hope we make a great example of i mean we did at the trial but I, i'm hoping the appeal goes the same way and then and and uh then then we can do a press release my client's really uh wants to <laughs> keep keep zipped about it until it's completely said and done but yeah gotcha. yeah Okay, so pro se right. means that he's representing himself, right? Just right, for right. people who don't know the term. Yeah, so, and you can get away with that as a yeah. landlord in JP courts. You know, like the he, my client told me when when they went to court the first time, he was chummy with the judge, and you know, it's like they're, well, oh, how was the barbecue last Saturday? <laughs> it's just it, it's nuts. So that's you know, and probably the, as a donor as well. Could have been, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I was I will, going to court a hundred, if I was suing a hundred people, I would donate to the judge I'm going to go in front of. Yeah. I, I will say campaign <laughs> finance rules for judges are, I think the strictest I've seen for any elected office. So that that's, I don't worry as much about that, you know, $2,500 cap per person. That's pretty low. I, I know plenty of attorneys who, they, if they could throw a hundred grand at somebody's campaign, <laughs> they'd do it. But, oh, um, yeah. well, I mean, not to, not to get off the rails here, but that's why we see so many packs. In the, in the judicial field as opposed to individual contributions so yeah. like if, if you if you want to uh donate to your judge but not get away with or not have it look like appear um in, in some negative way um donate to the tarrant county republican judges pack or whatever it's called and donate fifteen thousand dollars you know mm -hmm. uh, but yeah that's that's what if you look at those some of those expenditures and, and uh, not expenditures donations individual donations from it's it can get kind of absurd yeah uh, so yeah if you ever want to lose your mind uh go look at the texas ethics commission's website for a few days uh we, we did a town hall earlier with chris tackett so you just yeah. go watch that and it'll blow your mind where the money comes from and where it goes oh yeah okay yeah um so I, I wonder, uh, and I don't think this is either of y'all's expertise, so if you don't know, but how much of the issues that we have are caused by a lack of affordable housing? Because I feel like that's something we're having issues with, you know, all over, that just housing prices are going up and wages aren't. 
So even before COVID, you know, it's been an issue that seems like it's going on. I, I am getting more and more cases in which uh, there are a ton of co-tenants because that's the only way they can afford it. But um, yeah, as to how much of a problem that is overall with just landlord tenant issues, I, I don't know. I'm not seeing, I wouldn't say that was a main factor, but okay. Stewart's probably got a whole different angle to look at that from, so. Well, I mean, we just see, I mean, I guess, Whenever people can't afford to, to pay rent, I mean they're gonna they're gonna have to live where they need to live. Um, and if they can't afford to pay it, it's because rent's going up, for the most part, consistently, over time, uh, and to an, an extreme degree, uh, which is fueled by a whole bunch of different factors. Um, one of them is the actual rental market, which will f fuel uh, home rental values or home prices, uh, which makes it harder to buy a home, which makes you have to rent. Um, but there's a lot of things that, that, that are factors in that. The corporatization of low income housing is a huge factor. Uh, we're seeing large conglomerates come usually from the East and West Coast, mostly from the East Coast, come up and buy up all the low income housing, all the low income housing, uh, low, uh, what is it? The low income housing tax credit properties and a whole bunch of the section 811, section eight, section 202, a whole bunch of these publicly subsidized but privately owned properties are now consolidating in just a few groups. And it started up on the East Coast and they've swooped down here in, in Texas and across the Midwest in about the last decade. Um, and so it's, it's the consolidation of, of capital into a, a couple firms. And, and they really run it like a machine. They don't, they, they, they've stripped away some of the social services they've they've re in some in some instances in some of the properties that I have clients in straight up cut all social workers straight out of there, ones that will ones that were paid for by Medicaid but just straight up cut them out, um, uh, and and then pretty much rule it with an, run it with an iron fist right if there's any dissent you're evicted, mm -hmm. uh, we'll find a way right that's actually one of the appeals I have, um, uh, but yeah. Um, I think there's a huge, the, the, the issue of low-income housing is, is a much bigger issue, probably something to be tackled on a federal side, on the federal scale um, through HUD. Uh, but there's a lot of local things that can be done just in the, in the Texas legislature, but also uh, it would take a super majority, I think, in the Texas legislature to get any type of funding for, for public housing or, or, or subsidized housing or or, uh, or uh, tax credit, uh, credit programs that are state funded as, as opposed to through federal grants. Um, but locally um, ordinance, uh, zoning ordinances is probably the biggest thing, but that's gonna be at your city council and, and, and county commissioner level. Uh, what can be zoned for multifamily housing for high, for if you're trying to do high density, low income housing, as opposed to put people in get them out of what, what they used to, I hate the term, but used to call them ghettos, right? Get them out of ghettos and put them in the single family homes across across the Metroplex. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the zoning ordinances to try to zone for more multifamily housing is a big issue too. Hmm. I, you know, I think I was reading about it earlier today that it was, I think it was Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis had changed the zoning. So there's no more, there's no more such thing as a single housing zoning. So everything that's zoned for residential can be multifamily, which I'm not going to say I'm an expert, but it sounds like a good way to at least be able to increase density a little bit for more housing in, especially in city areas. Um, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, the cities are where the jobs are, right? Yeah. Increasingly so, right? Whether it's, I mean, whether you're in the, like the burgeoning, like work from home industry, right? Where you're allowed to work from home. Um, or you just at a city center, like the cities are where the jobs are. Um, and so you push people further out and we don't have the infrastructure to have public transportation or, or we have almost none like we have in Tarrant County or Denton County. Um, and they're forced to live in subpar housing in the city or in suburbs, as opposed to being able to be zoned into um, 
a multifamily setting that's a, a more suitable for their job and for their, for their kids' education. Yeah, zoning is a huge issue. Yeah. Um, I think that's, we're getting close to eight o'clock now. So um, I'll open up real quick if we have anybody who wants to ask a question real quick. Um, see, somebody said their rent went up from 645 to 950 a month in five years. So about a... Hey, I mean, yeah. talk about something that could be done day one. Like yeah. if, if something that you need to look at day one is uh, unreasonable rent increases. Yeah. Um, that's one of the biggest retaliatory tools that I see against my clients is that the, the lease will lapse and, and so it'll go month to month. And then the landlord can increase the rent every month if they want to until you can't pay for it anymore. Hmm. Or, or you'll see like my old apartment that the reason I live in this house now with three with two other roommates, <laughs> uh, exactly because I can't afford my own place where I want to live, the west side of Fort Worth. Um, my old apartment went from nine twenty to thirteen hundred dollars a month in one year. It's like yeah. okay, I guess I'm moving out. Yeah, that's excessive, and I, I think one one of the issues that I've kind of seen is, you know. Like I said, like I mentioned earlier, they kind of did half measures, but landlords still have to pay their rent. Tenants have to pay their rent, but, um, sorry, I'm trying to bring this co this thought together, but um, <laughs> what uh, I guess if somebody's housing insecure, what resources do they have? Right now there's, uh, this is what I said the last time I spoke uh, with you, Shaddy. Uh, if you just Google, just go to your go to your your Google machine, whether it's in your pocket or on your desk, right? Um, and type in your county and then rental assistance. That's probably the fastest way to find at least a list of phone numbers you can you can start hitting. Um, because most counties, I know Denton County has one. I know Tarrant County has one. As a vode of vol volunteer organizations in disasters, right? Um, that'll have a list of agencies where you can get resources, um, whether it's legal, like like what I do, or whether it's re direct rental assistance. And in Tarrant County, there's probably 30 or 40, 40 agencies that have received CARE CARES Act of money who can offer direct rental assistance. Okay. And there, I, I assume there are similar ones in Denton County, Evan. That, do you know about them? I don't. Okay. Uh, well, again, I mean, if, if you just Google, if, yeah, yeah, Denton County Rental Assistance, and it should be on the county's website. Uh, I, well, I know for Denton County, it is on the county's website. Um, and then uh, other other resources should pop up. Okay. All right. I, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so we're, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the larger broadcast shortly. But if our guests have a chance to stick around, we usually have additional Q&A time with people on Zoom afterwards. I want to thank Evan and Stuart for um, taking time out of their days to spend and talk with us. Our campaign is a grassroots movement focused on bringing awareness and attention to issues that matter to our community. But I absolutely couldn't do this on my own. It's with individuals donating in amounts that make sense for their budgets and the support of volunteers like you that we're going to be able to make sure as many of our neighbors in our community know about our campaign come November 3rd as possible. If you're interested in helping us get our message out or interested in donating to help us uh, fund the tools we need to push our campaign to as many people as possible during this quarantine, please visit www.shaddiesattune.com, which has links to our volunteer form and a donation link. Next week, we'll have Angela Brewer, our candidate for HD64, and we'll be talking healthcare in Texas. Thank you again for your time today. I hope to see you at one of our upcoming town halls. I'm Shaddies Atune, and together we can do this.